Good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you are located. Thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, for the Storage Investor Nation webinar today, uh, January 11th, 2022. Good to see everybody here. Um, I see a lot of folks who are uh, signing in um, for most of ours and a few new ones, so that's wonderful. Um, let me know uh, if you want to type in the chat box there where you guys are coming from. I always love to know uh, kind of what part of the country everybody is um, is listening or watching from. So um, that would be wonderful. A um, couple of things before we get started here. Um, I am going to share my screen with you guys um, and give you a look at a couple of things here. The main thing is our website, um, passiveinvesting.com. If you get the chance to go check it out, um, you'll be able to um, you know see the whole team here. Um, we've got, uh, you know, all of our partners, our multifamily folks, and then our storage folks. Um, that's, uh, my partner, Chris and I, uh, we lead the storage division, as you guys know, um, you can check that out. You can check out properties that we have in our portfolio, as well as current offerings that we have right now, ongoing deals. One of those, as you'll see, is our self-storage fund. Um, you see in the background there, one of the properties that we purchased, uh, back in August, um, real nice deal in outside the Triangle area in North Carolina, if you're familiar with that. But anyway, you can check that out. Um, some A lot of uh, great resources there and a lot of great information about PassiveInvesting.com. Uh, we also have, if you are not yet a part of it, a Facebook group. Um, I'm guessing if you are here for the webinars, you probably are familiar with that. But if not, I uh, definitely recommend checking that out great content on there, great discussions on there. We also have a podcast. Uh, we'll put links uh, in the chat, um, look, or it looks like they are coming in through the chat there um, to make it easy for you guys to find all this. But podcast storage investor nation is also a great resource that I highly recommend. So check that out when you can. One last thing before we get started here, if there are questions um, that you have as we're going along in the webinar, uh, feel free to, the best place to do it is in the Q&A section of Zoom. Um, type in your question there, and I'll do my best to get to it as we are going through the webinar. And if not, then uh, we'll, I'll try to catch everything at the end. Um, chat box is also okay, but the Q&A is probably the first place that we will see it. So um, any questions we can have, any clarification, feel free to let me know, and we will do that. So today we are gonna be talking about determining what your pro forma rents should be when you're underwriting self-storage. So this is something that's very, very important uh, for a lot of reasons, but the main reason is this is really what drives your pro forma. You have to know what rents you're gonna be able to achieve at a property before you make an investment decision because that's gonna impact so much what your cash flow is gonna be and whether or not you're going to be meeting your investment goals on a particular property. So the key things that we'll be going over today, we'll talk about how to understand the market that you're looking at. We'll talk about how to determine which of the comps are relevant in your comp study. We'll talk about how you can find some data on occupancy. There's a couple of different things that we'll go over in that regard. And then we'll talk about how to position your property alongside all of those comps that you're looking at. You know, you, you don't always take the average of, you know, the four or five that you're checking out. Um, you know, you have to think about where is my property gonna be in relation to these other comps. And we'll talk about that. We'll also have uh, some uh, sort of pro tips along the way. Uh, we'll go over some Q and A for sure and uh, so much more. So. We'll get started with the first key thing, which is understanding the market. So if you don't have a good solid understanding on the competitive environment in your market, you can be way off in your pro forma rents if you don't understand that. Um, and you will often have to defend a market to a lender, particularly if you're going into the, something that's not a kind of gateway or primary market uh, you know, we have, we, we've gone into several markets before in our self-storage assets where we, it might be just outside a major MSA. 
and you know we a lot of times you know if we're in a major msa then it's it's a lot easier to tell that story to a lender but if we're talking to a lender who's not familiar with the particular submarket we will have to explain to them we'll have to tell that story and and to explain to them why we feel like that's a great market to be in so there's a couple of things that you want to have a really good understanding of as you're analyzing a market you want to understand how much competition you have. You want to talk about what am I competing for? And I'm, in that I'm referring to your customers. What sort of customers are you competing for? And then what is sort of the class of the competition that you're looking at? So in terms of how much competition, there's a couple of things that you can do. Uh, we recommend checking out just what's the number of facilities that we are dealing with. You know, do we have one in our you know trade area or do we have 10 you know generally as we've talked about before the trade area for self storage is primarily the 3 mile radius from the facility uh, a lot of times you go out to the 5 mile radius that would be more uh, prudent to do but definitely be checking out the 3 mile which will be very important you know people don't want to drive you know 30 minutes to go store their stuff and it, because they don't want something to be that inconvenient. So in addition to the number of facilities, what is kind of the industry standard as far as what is the supply of storage in a market is a metric that we've talked a little bit about before, which is square feet per capita or square feet per person. So this would be taking a look at the population in the trade area and saying of all the total square footage of all the facilities that are in this trade area, if I divide that by the population, how many square feet per person am I looking at in this market? The average nationally uh, as a data point is about six to seven uh, square feet per person. Now, there are some limitations to this method. You know, if you are looking, for example, in a one mile radius, which a lot of times is important to do, but if you're looking at a one mile radius, you might have mostly commercial you know, real estate around you. You might have shopping centers, office buildings, and your residential development, your actual population is gonna be very low. And that could give you a very high square feet per person. Same thing sort of for the three mile, just again, depending on what part of the country you're in, what part of you know, a particular market you're in. Uh, an, another limitation to the square feet per person is it doesn't take into account what the demand is for storage in that area. You know, you need to do to determine the demand, you need to do the things that we're going to be talking about on this webinar, which is determining what rent you can get in a particular market. You know, if you can get great rent, if all of your comps are very high occupancy, then a higher square feet per person is feasible. Uh, but again, if you're on the other side of that, if all the comps have, you know, tons of availability, your rents, you know, kind of not anything to write home about, then you need to be more concerned about square feet per person. So it's a data point. It's an important one to understand, but just know the limitations of it and know how to include that in your analysis of a particular investment. So that's a little bit about how to determine how much competition you have, how much you're dealing with. You also wanna know what type of customers am I competing for? Because th this will highly influence the amount of rent that you can get at a particular property. So the kind of the gold standard for, uh, for class of customer in storage or in most real estate for that matter is what are the incomes for the surrounding population? And there's a handful of ways to get that data. The most common is, uh, you know, there's uh, ra radius plus would be a, a good uh, example for storage, um, ra radiusplus.com. If you check that out or Google that, that's, that's usually got some good information on a particular market, being able to see what the median income is. And it is generally median income is going to be your best indicator of of the incomes you know for a particular population uh, there's others that are you know, other resources that are a little bit more expensive uh, that you can pay for yardy matrix would be one um, costar is is another one that folks use a lot of times for multifamily or other asset classes 
but you want to understand what are the income levels of this particular submarket that I'm looking at. And then you also need to understand what sort of residential growth is in the area. You know, if you are looking at, you know, a market where there's 2,000 homes coming in within a, you know, three mile radius, you know, that's fantastic. And you know that you're going to have a lot more customers than if you're in a market where there's, you know, not any or just not as much residential development. So it's important to understand that too. What is the growth in a market? You definitely don't want to be in a market where there's negative growth and you want to be careful about going into one where there's very low growth or lackluster growth. So understand what customers, how many customers you are going to have in a particular market. And then you need to know just what is the class of your competition. Uh, and you'll need to analyze, you know, where is this facility that you are underwriting? Where is that in comparison to the class of other properties? You know, am I a multi-story you know, um, class A brand new construction building and everyone else around me is not, uh, or am, am I the other way around or am I close to, you know, the other comps in the area? You need to understand where you are relative to the competition. So this, these things will give you a good idea of what your market looks like or really what your sub market looks like. Uh, or trade area is another way to say it, like we talked about, kind of that three to five mile radius. The next thing that you're gonna wanna do is determine which of the comps in your area are relevant. So I'm gonna share a screen here. Um, we, I, I mentioned that Yardi Matrix uh, as a good resource for uh, understanding a market. And I'm gonna share, uh, that. that is a resource that we use at passiveinvesting.com and I'm gonna pull that up here so everybody can see it. So this is, it's Yardi Matrix, it's a paid data. Uh, we found it to be very helpful. If you look here, what I've done is I've just picked a facility. This is not one that we own. This is just one we, at one time, we're underwriting it uh, near in my area, Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, it was a good example of one that we can look at uh, for these purposes. So. I am looking at this, it's an extra space storage in Charlotte, North Carolina here. And <clears throat> what I've done is I'm looking up the competitive environment for this facility. This is showing me what are the comps for this facility. And I've got a couple of filters on. I, th I think I've got a three mile radius filter on. And so it's, it's giving me three different comps here. Now I need to think about which ones are the relevant comps for me to use in my market study. And you're generally thinking about two things in determining which of these are relevant, convenience and class. So if I am looking at a facility that is, you know, let's say I've got these three comps here and if I, I'm looking at a facility that, you know, I'm the, I'm the one who's in everybody's backyard and you have to drive away from you know, all the housing to get to these others here, that's a good thing. You know, you're the most convenient. Um, of course, if it's the other way around, then you wanna be careful. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do the deal, but it just means you need to think about that as you're doing your study. Uh, these here, it looks like they're all within the three mile radius. Uh, so what I would do as I'm underwriting this investment is I would look at, you know, pull up, Google Earth or Google Maps or what, whatever map software that has satellite on it that you use and look at where the neighborhoods are, where the apartments are, and compare that to where these facilities are. Uh, I'm going to share actually another screen uh, to show you how I did that with this particular, um, this particular property. So I looked up, um, this is a different uh, window here. I looked up this extra space. It's this one right here uh, in Charlotte. And I looked, I just, I just Googled self-storage. You can see over here. And this is showing me all of the properties, you know, within whatever radius I'm looking at. So if you remember from the other one, there was a life storage. That's this one right here. There was a Brookshire mini storage. That's this one right here. 
And then there was the next closest was a cube smart self storage here. So those are the three that we'll look at for these purposes. Now, as you can see, the housing in on this map here is pretty spread out. You know, there's a lot up here. There's a lot kind of in between <clears throat> me and the cube smart. Uh, there's a good amount in between me and these other two. So I don't think that I'm going to have too big of a convenience, um, you know, plus or minus as I'm looking at my comps, because these are all pretty close to to different um, different housing. So you know that's we we kind of check that box. I'm also going to be looking at the class of the facility, and you can do that. The simplest way is just to Google. Uh, you know, each facility, check it, check out the pictures, maybe check out Google Earth, Street View or something like that. Um, and that'll help you understand, you know, what type of facility I'm looking at. You can also look at, if we're back on Yardy here, where I was before, you can look at these. Um, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock into, you know, they kind of say what class, you know, the improvements are, what class the location is. We found those to not always be the most accurate. So it's better to get a look at it for yourself, whether it's local to you, you're able to drive the market, or if you just go look up you know, pictures on the website. So what I determined was that this, you know, if I'm looking at this facility, this is also a fairly new facility um, that we, we just know that from when we were underwriting it. This one here, Brookshire Mini Storage is probably, ba based on what I saw when we looked at this, this is probably not gonna be a very relevant comp for me. And if I, if I look up the comp, uh, the, the rents for this facility, I'm gonna find that they're gonna be a lot lower than what I can actually achieve because we just, we have different customers that we're competing with. So I'm probably either not gonna look at that one or I'm mo more likely I will look at it just to know so I can kind of be able to tell a story and answer some questions if a lender asks me, but I'm not gonna be making my decision on pro forma rents from this one. These other two from the research that I did are more comparable in terms of class. Uh, we already saw that convenience, they're pretty close you know, to one another, pretty close to the housing. So we're looking at the class now and they're more similar to the one that I'm looking at, especially this CubeSmart here. Both of these are pretty close to each other and they were both relatively new construction at the time. So, I've done my research on which of the comps are the most relevant, which of them are, are the most convenient compared to me, and which of them are a similar class compared to me. So now that I've done that, I've got a good idea of which ones are relevant. Now I'm going to look up the actual rents that I feel like I can get for this property. Now to get the, to get the rents is fairly simple. Um, I'll go back to that screen I was just on. You know, most of the time you can go on the website for a property and you can find, uh, for example, this life storage. This is the one I pulled up that we were looking at um, as a comp for that extra space. This one, you know, you can see on the website, you know, I've got rents there. Um, they offer a discount if you get, uh, get a, um, if you rent online versus if you walk into the store, that's pretty common. But you can see what the what the rents are, and again, the kind of the gold standard for uh, for storage comps is the 10 by 10 units. Um, I will show another screen in a few minutes here to kind of show get, give you a good idea of how you determine um, which ones you um, which ones you need to look at in terms of unit types, unit sizes, uh, but. Generally, you always want to look at the 10 by 10. That just gives you a good idea of overall what that market looks like. Now you can see these guys don't have, it looks like any 10 by 10s available. I skip from you know, five by 15 to 10 by 15. So now what we've learned is with life storage, that means that they have them, nine times out of 10, it means they have them. They just don't have any available because they're full, which is a great thing. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But point is for rents, it's generally pretty easy because you can look on the website. Worst case, if they don't have a website, you can call. Um, for example, that 10 by 10, it would be good to call this place and just ask them, hey, if a 10 by 10 were to become available, you know, what do you think I'd be, you know, paying for that? 
So, you know, again, you're just calling, you can kind of, you know, um, position yourself as somebody who is interested in renting from the facility. And the folks at the call centers that you talk to, they will be helpful. Um, they'll be, you know, most of the one, most of the folks that we, that we talk to, if I need to call one of these facilities, they'll be very nice, very cordial, and they'll, they'll be helpful. Um, because, uh, if, especially if you kind of, you know, make it look like you're interesting, interested in renting of that facility. I will say, so I said we'd have some pro tips along the way. If you call and you're asked to give them your phone number, I don't recommend doing that because you will, uh, you will get calls, even if they say that it's just in case you get disconnected, you will get calls to ask if you're still interested and you will get them until you answer the phone and say no. So uh, pro tip there, just remember that. Now, in terms of, so this we've talked about rent, in terms of occupancy, so with occupancy, you know, the, you know a, a tip on that too, you don't really need to know what the exact occupancy is at a facility. You really just wanna know if it's high or not. So it, you know, if, if occupancy at a facility is 98% versus you know, 94%, you don't really care which one it is. It's just good to know that this one is for the most part full. So that's what you really want to be uh, looking at. So there's some, some of the times websites, I'll go back to that uh, screen. Some of the times the websites will say on them a little bit about how much uh, how many units they have available. So you can see here, you know, these five by eights, they have one left, five by 15, one left, 10 by 15, one left. So that's all great. Um, you know, this 10 by 25 here, it doesn't say, so we may need to call and find that out. And not all websites will say this. Not all of them will say how many they have left or, um, you know, and we talked just a minute ago about that, those 10 by 10s looks like they're all full, which is a great thing. So if the website you're looking at does not have the occupancy on the particular units that you're looking for, then you will need to call. And all you're gonna need to do to get this, you, you can pay for data on occupancy if you want to. Um, I don't recommend paying extra for that because you can find out what you need to know without using paid data. So you can talk to somebody and just ask, you know, good strategic questions. You know, you can, you can ask if you're asking about 10 by 10s, you can say, hey, how many of these do you have available? Uh, maybe you say, you know, are you guys pretty full right now? If you're talking to somebody who's, um, you know, maybe more talkative, you can say, oh, how's business going for you guys? Um, another one that I've asked before is, if I were to rent a 10 by 10 today, and then I move my stuff in, I realize I need another one, you know, would you have another one available pretty quickly? And a lot of times, you know, they'll, folks that I talk to will say, oh yeah, we're, um, you know, we're full or, oh yeah, we got plenty available here. Um, that can give you a pretty good idea of what the occupancy is like at a facility. So then what I will do, I'm sharing a lot of screens today, but um, what I'm going to do is go to a comp study that I uh, that we did on a particular facility. Um, I changed some of the, I, I kind of adapted it to the one that we were looking at, that extra space. Um, and uh, I've got the life storage, uh, Cube Smart, uh, that's left over from another uh, deal. But the life storage and the Cube Smart are the main ones that I'm looking at. And I mentioned earlier how the 10 by 10 is kind of the gold standard, but you do want to think through what some of the other unit types are. And here's what I mean by that. I've got a unit mix here. Uh, this, this facility has, um, has some wine storage there, which is pretty interesting. Uh, but I've got a unit mix that uh, you know, shows me every unit type, how many there are, what the rent is. You know, this is we talked, we've talked before about a rent roll. Um, in our underwriting webinars. And this is where I got that. And this is just summarizing it basically. What I wanna do is I wanna look through this unit mix and I wanna determine, hey, of all of the unit types, which of the unit types are the ones where if I change the rent, it's gonna move the needle the most. So I've got a count here of each unit type and I can see pretty easily that, hey, five by tens, they got 93. 
10 by 10s, I got 195, 110 by 15s. So I know that those are the ones that are going to be the most impactful in my underwriting if I can get better rents on these or not as good rents on these. So what I decided to do for this facility was look at 5 by 10s, 10 by 10s, 10 by 15s. Maybe a little bit more than needed to, but just to you know, kind of do a little bit of extra, that's what I decided to do. And all I did was I went online to these comps and I was able to determine, uh, you know, what the rent would be. Uh, some of them I had to call, uh, but, um, and as, as I, I have a column here for occupancy as well, as you can see, and I'm just typing in, you know, I'm not putting in 95%. I'm just putting in, hey, this one's full. Uh, this one is, you know, they only have one left. Um, what you also want to think about is a lot of times you'll have a property where they say they have a ton available, but it might be because they're in lease up stage. So maybe they just opened, you know, last year and they're only 40% full. Well, that's, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do the deal that you're looking at because one of your comps is only 40% full. You know, you need to think about that for other underwriting reasons, but the reason they're full is because, or they're not full is because they're new. So again, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do a deal. Um, you, sh you should find out how long a facility has been open uh, when you're doing this analysis. But that's what I've done. I've looked at five by tens, 10 by tens, 10 by 15s. I ended up calling each one of them to get the occupancy data, found you know rents and everything online. And I did, that. that's what I used to do my actual comp study. So once you have done all of this analysis here and you've done all the things that we've already talked about, you need to think about how to position your property alongside the comps that you've looked into. Checking to see if we got any questions yet. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's any. Um, if you do, again, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in and we will get to them as soon as we can. Uh, so you need to be thinking about where am, is my facility relative to the competition? And you remember the relevance question that we asked before, which comps are relevant? We're looking at convenience, and we're looking at class, and then I'm going to add, we just talked about lease up facilities, you know, um, that doesn't mean if it's, uh, if you have a lot of availability at a lease up property, that's okay. However, you do need to think about the lease up deals around you, because that's going to impact how long it takes for you to get your property at the um, the, the conditions that you are assuming in your underwriting. So if you think that, you know, if you're, if you have a property that right now it's getting, you know, 85 cents a foot on average in rents, and you think that based on the competition, you can get a dollar 10 cents for rent. Well, that's great, you know, and that may be accurate, but if, it, if you have a two new facilities, you know, in your market, well, it's probably going to take you longer to get up to that dollar and 10 cents because, you know, a lot of people, if, they, if it's a similar class facility that's, you know, a mile from you that's in lease up and maybe because they're in lease up, they're only charging 50 cents a foot for, you know, whatever unit type. Well, you know, people are human beings. Why would they rent from you at 90 cents a foot when somebody else with similar class facility, uh, similar, you know, convenience location, if, if they're offering almost half price, you know, they're going to rent from that person most likely. So you need to, you know, eventually they will be up to market if they're a good operator, but you do need to think about it will take you longer to implement your business plan, you know, to get rents where you need them to be. A big pro tip in that regard Make sure that before your money goes hard, whether it's earnest money or, or whatever, before the money goes hard, you definitely want to get a look at that market by, you know, if it's local, great, you can drive it before you even make an offer. If it's, you know, across, halfway across the country, you need to go out there, fly, uh, depending on, maybe you're able to do that before, maybe you're not, but before you put down any earnest money that is going hard, you want to go out and drive that market. 
you know, it's maybe sound kind of obvious, you know, that you want to be able to lay eyes on the property and, you know, the facilities around it, but you really want to understand if there are, if there is new construction around you that you're not seeing when you look online or when you look on whatever paid data source you are using. I'll give you a great example, uh, which is a property that we recently closed on in the Denver, Colorado MSA. So Chris and I went out to tour the facility. Uh, we drove the market, we loved it. We were looking at a couple of deals out there, just ended up working out really convenient. And so as we drove up to our facility, what we found was that there was a literally right next door. I mean, they shared a driveway. There was another facility that was just opening. Wasn't really a whole lot about it online. And so we weren't able to see you know, how close it was but it's literally right next door. Now, this was a fantastic location. The rents e that even that property was getting, the new property, uh, were still very high. And so we were able to still do the deal because, because of the market, because of the rents that both properties were achieving. But we had to think about that in terms of how long will it take us to implement our business plan. We knew that it would take longer because that, you know, there was a brand new facility right next door. And so we factored that into our underwriting and that impacted the price that we were able to pay. So you always want to get a good look at what the market is. You know, if we had not done that, then we probably would have paid, you know, more money than we should have uh, because we would have, we, we would not have been aware of that facility. So just a tip there, make sure you drive the market before you have a bunch of money that goes hard there. Uh, I see a question that came in here. The unit mix you have is very complete. How did you acquire that data? Did you have to call many numerous times to populate your list or did you get lucky and they were available online? Any other tips to acquire that data besides Yardi Matrix? So uh, yes, great question, Eric. So the unit mix that I was looking at, that was from the facility that we were underwriting. So when we, you know, we've talked before about what are the documents that you need to underwrite, one of the things you have to have is a unit mix. Most likely, if a seller is not providing you with a unit mix or they say they can't, they're probably not really a serious seller. Uh, it's not hard to get and you just, you need that to be able to do your underwriting. Um, so I, that's where I got that data from. Um, and then I, as we went through that, you saw how we were, we were figuring out which of the unit types were going to be the most important. And then we decided to look at those on the competing facilities. But yeah, where I got that data is from the unit mix that the seller provided to us. So hope, hope that uh, answers the question there. Um, see another one uh, coming in here. I was hoping to see an Excel spreadsheet that shows how to underwrite these properties. Yeah, so that's a great question. I recommend if you go to our Storage Investor Nation site, there are, the, Chris and I actually did a series on underwriting. Um, that will be that, a lot of great content there. We did, I think, exactly what you're looking for, which is we, we, we took a deal, we went through our whole model and everything, um, how we, we didn't go into detail on, you know, the, what we're talking about today, you know, doing the pro forma rents. But we, we did, I think, exactly what you're looking for. If you go check out the underwriting um, series that we did, um, highly recommend that. I think that'll be exactly what you are looking for. So uh, back to positioning your property, talked about you know, making sure you're driving the market. Um, you're really just looking back to that relevance question, like I said, what, you know, what is the convenience of your property versus the comps? What class are they? And then you, you don't want to be, you know, at the top of the market. So if you determine that, you know, for 10 by 10s, they're renting at, you know, a dollar, 10 cents, you know, in, in that market on average, you don't want to say, oh, well, I think I can get a dollar 15. You know, maybe you can, but you're going to have to defend that to your lender. And if your answer of, why you think you can get above market is oh, I just think I can. You know, that's not a good answer. They're probably not going to. Uh, they're probably going to give you a lower valuation or lower loan proceeds than you're looking for. And you also want to not be underwriting to the top of the market. 
because it's important in underwriting to be conservative. You don't want to overestimate what rents you think you can get and end up doing a bad deal. Um, so I always say be conservative, but be realistic. It helps if you have a partner who uh, maybe is not always as conservative as you are. Um, but because uh, uh, otherwise, if you're like me and you're a CPA, you're always the conservative guy, you might pass up some good deals because you're a little too, maybe you cross into the realm of pessimism and uh, not so much conservatism. Uh, but make sure that you are being conservative in your underwriting. You don't want to do a bad deal. So this is something that you need to make sure you get right, what your pro forma rents are, like we talked about. You know, if you're too high, then your lender is going to call you on it and you're going to have a hard time telling a story to them. But if you're too low, then you can miss some really good deals. So you know, nobody's going to be perfect. Nobody's going to get it exactly right. But you want to make sure that you are doing all the research you can on pro forma rents to make sure that you are as accurate as you can be um, so that you can make sure you're doing a good deal and make sure you're not passing up good deals as well. So that's about all I have for today. I see a couple of other um, questions that are coming in. Is that the Facebook site on? Yes, so I think David, the link uh, was posted. I'll post it again here so everybody can see in the chat. Uh, but yeah, definitely check out that Facebook group, recommend that. Um, see another class or another uh, question. What is a cap for a class to be a good deal? So interesting question. We get we get that question a lot. Um, we don't actually use cap rate as um, when we're determining what we can pay for a property most of the time. I might think through that at a very high level when we're first starting our analysis to determine, you know, is this a deal we're going to look at or not? Uh, but I, I don't normally say, you know, okay, we think that based on this market, this should be a seven cap or a, or a five cap or a four cap. Um, we are looking at, you know, what our investment goals are for our investors and can we meet those goals conservatively, you know, at whatever price that we're paying. So, you know, maybe it's a, we, we've bought deals on, you know, six caps. We've bought lease up deals that are technically negative caps. Uh, you know, so if you're looking at, if there's a facility that just opened, like one we bought just outside the Triangle area in North Carolina, that one had only been open for about three months. And so their revenue, their expenses exceeded their revenues. So technically we had a negative cap rate. So uh, cap is not always the best way to value real estate. It's more of kind of a data point, something you should be thinking about. Um, maybe more relevant on a deal that's fully stabilized, um, but uh, there's there's so many variables to you know to what um, to each property um, it's hard it's hard to say what's a good cap rate. So if you've been following uh, general market conditions, you know cap rates have been going down lately. It's getting harder and harder to compete many times. See when uh, see another question when looking at OMS, how realistic is the pro forma? Uh, that the brokers estimate. I feel like this can be wrong or way optimistic. Um, Bree, you nailed it. Um, of course, uh, you know, now I I'll say we work with some great brokers um, that do a really good job with their underwriting. And, you know, we, we of course would never depend on that for decision making. We're going to do our own homework. Uh, but yes, you're exactly right. Uh, generally, they are going to be more optimistic, and that's that's okay. That's understandable because they're working for the seller, and they're going to want to you know get the seller the best price possible. So they're not going to be as you know they're not concerned about you as a buyer making a you know great investment decision. You know, and it's nothing against them. That's just it's not their job to make sure that you are doing your job they're going to want to present an optimistic scenario. So yes, the we will always do our own homework. We kind of look at their underwriting. You know, as, as an example, if I look at their underwriting and I see maybe some red flags in that, maybe I see that, you know, they, they want, you know, a certain 
you know, say they want $5 million for a property and the real estate taxes that they're using in their assumption is assuming that the property gets assessed for $2 million. Well, I know that my property taxes are probably going to be double what they think they're going to be in their underwriting. That's a red flag. So I know that's probably going to be tough to make that deal work at their price. If I see that, you know, in a particular market, this is probably a five cap market or a 550 cap for a stabilized property and the op the operating cap rate. So your return that you're getting and uh, not considering debt, uh, your return that you're getting in year three is, you know, a, a 475. Well, I'm not going to be able to make that work. You know, if it's going to take me three years to get to the point where I'm not even getting the same return that most people are getting on a stabilized property, it's probably not worth my time to go through that. Um, of course, thinking through, you know, is this a lease up deal or something like that? Is there a reason that I would be paying way lower of a cap? Um, see a comment coming in here on OMS. We find the income side to be fairly close and realistic, but it's the expenses that we really have to dive into property taxes, payroll, management fees, marketing, um, et cetera. Yes, Bob, great point there. Um, and I'm really glad to see Bob Copper uh, joining in. Um, the Copper Storage Solutions manages all of our properties and they do a fantastic job. Been very happy with them and glad to be doing business. And that's a great comment from Bob there. A lot of times the income side on in OMS can't be fairly close. Um, but yes, the expenses is where you have to deal, have to really dig in. And the biggest reason, in my opinion, is because you're probably, you know, maybe you are, but you're probably not going to run the property the same way that the seller is. You know, a lot of times if you're with the way you are finding a deal that makes sense for you to do is because you can improve on the way that they are running it. Uh, so you need to know, okay, based on how I am going to operate this asset, what are my expenses going to be? And you also need to think through, um, as uh, Bree was pointing out, you know, are they just being too optimistic in their underwriting of expenses? So yes, great comments there, great questions. I don't see anything else coming in. Uh, so if, uh, if any other questions uh, that you think of later that we can help you with, feel free to shoot out a message on um, or a post on the Facebook group. I highly recommend that. Like I said, we've got the link in there a couple of times. Check that out. Check the podcast out. Um, and if you haven't registered for the next webinar coming up next week, make sure you go to the Storage Investor Nation website to do that. Um, ho hopefully this is great content for you guys. Uh, always enjoy you know, kind of passing on lessons that we've learned, lessons that we're learning now. Um, and always great to see everybody signing in. Um, there is the link in the chat there for the Storage Investor Nation website. So um, check that out, register for the next webinar. So that's it for today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm John Allen, and uh, we will see everybody next time.